Things would be important is that the actual annotated bibliography for this video entry. I'm going to show it to you right here so that I don't have to talk about it. There's nothing to add anymore. We get this material of them to grow them to say as well. So, as you can see, we've got a few great texts to cover, and there might be some surprises thrown in the middle as well. So, as an overview, we are going to be doing theory with a few of my favorite words, um, those being bodies, symbols, and gestures. Also tying into those, we're going to have a little sidetrack talk, especially around Judith Butler's undiagnosing gender on what J.D. describes as a dilemma, and what I'm going to call the split between individual problems and societal and systematic barriers. First text we'll be coming to terms with comes from Matilda Bernstein's book more about her organ. The same question is by Simon Chess and a bunch of other radical authors from Pisser, which we'll talk about in a moment. And it's called Calling All Western Revolutionaries. Uh, I'm absolutely in love with this piece because a lot of my life really feels like it's about Westerns all the time. So first I'm gonna spill a little bit about my history and the things I'm learning for Western. I have been associated with the French Revolution at the Union for almost two years, and a big part of our work ends up being around Western safety and accessibility. So I feel really privileged to often have a chance to be paid to talk about restrooms, to be paid to talk about restrooms with having the figures at the youth, like our Vice President and Vice Provost for Africa University, Dr. Rusty Buxler. Um, I I really privileged to have had so much experience hearing with the many radical queer and trans folks and allies in my life about the importance of restroom safety and accessibility, and how that's really one huge point of connection of uh, transgender rights movements with other movements, especially those such as disability rights, and more the history of this sort of activism in you know, a specific university of Minnesota context goes back um, about three or four years now. In this article in Max Revolting, we're actually looking at the history of this organization, Pisser, People in Search of Safe and Accessible Restrooms. It goes back to about 2003. It was actually formed at the California Students of Color Conference happening at UC Santa Barbara back in 2003. Um, so I, I really enjoy learning about this history and seeing how a lot of the work that was laid out in the restroom surveys and the ways that they approached surveying restrooms very loudly and visibly with bright colors. Um, we see the connection of that work to kind of how we carry on now and how we continue to be loud and bold about the things we say about the need for accessible and safe restrooms. A little bit more about Pisser. Um, I grabbed three great points from the mission to sum up on um, this first to raise awareness about what safe and accessible restrooms are and why they are necessary. Uh, second, map and verify accessible and or gender the restrooms on the campus. And third, to advocate for additional safe and accessible restrooms, um, especially in the case of new buildings, and then hopefully in the case of, of buildings with, with little or no accessible restrooms nearby, um, you know, completely modern in those cases. Um, what I also have to notice um, was the, the really great focus on coalition building that I think then and in, in the past continues to come to work around restroom access and safety. Um, and so in the case of Pisser, really great coalitions formed on the University of California campus with a group called On the Flow and the Plug Patrol, a group uh, whose basic mission was to provide access to tampons and pads in restrooms on campus, especially restrooms that may not be typically associated as um, 
in existence for folks with those needs. So again, we need to really need sex restrooms became a big target for also providing these. Um, the, the coalition was also joined um, by folks seeking more access for child care. Um, that mostly including you know, changing tables and restrooms again, specifically in places that they may not um, typically be viewed as necessary. You know, the favorite statements that come out of this essay before I spend way too long talking about it and you don't get to hear me saying anything about other fantastic essays is that this work becomes all about bodies. In fact, they, they make very visible. We seek to, again, talk really loudly about how this is about bodies and, and we, like, embodying the theories which they speak um, which is really resonating with me right now. It seems to be something that keeps coming up for us in class, sort of doing and being and, and all of our questions surrounding those theories, which is, um, I guess, what it, what it comes down to in the context of Kisser and their work at least back in 2003, probably stretching about 2004, at the time that this was first published, um, that I, I, I really kind of find myself going back to the time though that I messed up on the whiteboard for you all, that um, it, it becomes a talk about bodies and symbols, and, and really how we find ourselves immersed in a society where, um, you know, all of us are entrenched in belief that certain symbols are for some bodies, and these symbols are then not for other bodies, and, you know, we can find as the basis of most of that, or most of the basis of it, in genitals. Um, and from there, we kind of carried on to um, talking about the shame associated with bodies, um, which we'll get to a lot more later, but I want to point it out now that, in fact, um, these systematic reinforcements of certain symbols being for some, but not for others, and then when you use these symbols that are not for your bodies, there are definitely punishments correlated um, that, you know, we, we have a, a, a repetition of, of our figure with gender police telling us that you know, some symbols are for you and some are not. And, and, and again, we find ourselves in a, in a place where we will always choose wrong, whether we're choosing wrong in terms of consequences and punishment, or we're choosing wrong in terms of, you know, a sort of authenticity for being true to oneself. And that is both true. Now, I say bonus. Um, because I, I know that this is uh, an essay that a lot of folks have read. It's a nice, short, breezy, Ginsburg essay that doesn't get too wordy and big. Um, it's certainly not this other Ginsburg piece that I've got lying around. Um, this is a policy, policy, advocacy, and trans survival, ID, sex segregation, and health access, all by Ginsburg. It's, it's fairly unintimidating at this level, but in turn, you know, how wide this document is, you can, you can really appreciate it, a short essay like Fighting to Win. And just to clarify, Fighting to Win also comes from the amazing that's revolting by Matilda. So, in Fighting to Win, I see a really strong parallel between the rhetoric that Dean Spade is putting forth and um, the, the restroom politics represented by Pisser from our last article. Um, they're looking at sort of the same process of, of lifting the polarity between queer and trans activism and disability activism. And, and more than that, I mean, Dean Spade, in his typical fashion, is, is really looking at prioritizing the needs of the most marginalized communities, um, especially within you know, an already marginalized community, such as queer or, or disabled communities. Um, that Dean Spade is, is also looking at, you know, the prioritized needs of low-income folks, of color, people with disabilities, um, people living with HIV, old people, and um, so we state is really seeking, um, you know, really a movement away from identity politics, which I mean, we've talked about in other contexts, such as um, punks, providers, and welfare queens, way back at the beginning of the semester. So Dean's state is really relevant about looking at a broader framework of social justice.